Anyway, let's continue. So this topic from or this article from BBC News um, is titled, funnily enough, I've spent my life. I spent my life in fear of being called fat, which is essentially I'm assuming some kind of fat positive uh, body positive message going on here, which, you know, again, I have no, I have no objection to. Um, let's probably read the article and then we can comment to it. Or maybe I'll give my overview. Let me give an overview on what I think of the fat movement um, or the body positive movement. I'm not against it, right? I think for a long period of my life, maybe from the age of like, when I start getting lunch money, probably from the age of 14 to maybe 22, 23, I was morbidly obese, right? I was way, uh, well, way too fat. I probably was like 20 stone, 260 pounds for my height. It's just insane, right? Now I'm about 220, 219 on a good day. I want to get down to 200 by the end of the year. But I was a really big dude, right? A really fat dude for a long period of my life. And but I still had the same kind of personality I have now. I was still, you know, pretty happy go lucky. Uh, but I was quite self. I was quite self aware of how fat I was because I couldn't play sports the way I wanted to do. I couldn't run the way I wanted to run. I couldn't play football the way I wanted to play football. This thing I just couldn't do my body because I knew what was holding me back and it was the weight. And it was annoying, but I just couldn't help myself from eating. Right? I was just kind of a fat dude that didn't tend to kind of like stop eating. Um, obviously, um, I wouldn't say my family is inherently big. We're bigger people, but we're not fat people. So it was obviously something that I kind of had done to myself just through like, lack of discipline uh, and lack of kind of, you know, um, acknowledgement of kind of what I'm doing to myself and just kind of blaming the outside world for everything. But it did kind of get to a head, especially when I turned 21, when I realized that I was unable to attract the girls that I wanted to attract in my life. And again, it's maybe a very surface level way to look at it. I'm super conceited and a bit, you know, um, self-absorbed and a bit whatever it may be. But that was my experience. I couldn't, number one, get the girls I wanted in life. And I also couldn't wear the clothes I wanted because I, I was very much into fashion as I am now. And it just kind of, there was always a bit of a... a uh, a barrier there. There was, there's only so far you could get to. There's only so much personality a girl could appreciate in you before she starts looking at you a bit yucky. There's only so much. There's only so many bigger jeans you could wear or baggy clothes you could wear before you start to feel a bit self conscious. So I always felt a bit weird around people or dressed in the stuff that I was dressed in. It's just part of my life, isn't it? So I obviously went for a bit of a change, a bit of a metamorphosis. I kind of went into. I started picked up, picked up running. I, I went deep into CrossFit. I started eating healthy. And all because I wanted to lose the weight and look better in clothes. That was it. There was no other reason I wanted to do that. I wanted to look better in clothes and that, that was it. And I wanted to attract girls. Simple as that. But I have a lot of understanding and I have a lot of appreciation for the fat movement now. Because back then, when I was younger, that didn't really exist. It probably doesn't really exist now in the wider scheme of things. But I think for the most part, people would look at you a bit sideways if you took the piss out of somebody when they were fat. When I was younger, taking the piss out of you when you are fat was just part and parcel of the, of the role. Part of the reason why I probably have quite a thick skin now is because... I got teased consistently, especially when it was PE, right? And I was, you know, got my top off. People were taking the piss out of me all the time. And it hardens you, right? It makes you have tougher skin. You, um, It kind of improves your ability to kind of rip people as well back because you're having to take it and give it as well every single day. It never, ever ends. If you know anything about boys, the way we connect and the way we kind of uh, build friendship is through kind of that kind of weird conflict, right? We're always kind of teasing, poking each other, fighting each other. And that's how you essentially become really close friends. Um, through constantly ribbing um, of each other. And I have some of my best friends were people that were, you know, essentially caused me to go and cry in the toilet one day, right? They're some of my best friends because, you know, we were able to kind of get, get past that moment. But I don't know if I would have liked this movement to have been around when I was in school. I don't know if I would have been the person I am now if I had somebody telling me it's okay to be the way that I am. And that's the only issue that I have about the fat movement. I'm okay with telling people that, you, not everyone needs to be skinny. I'm okay with understanding that we're all made in different shapes and sizes, but this under this kind of weird bit at the end of it, especially towards the the end of the spectrum of the fat acceptance movement, where they try to persuade you that being that morbidly obese is healthy, and there's no you know, and there's no in intrinsic health issues that are associated with being that big and carrying amount carrying that amount of that amount of that amount of weight around with you, and also the understanding that. If you're that big, it usually means you're eating things that you probably shouldn't eat to excess. Um, I don't know. That's the thing that I'm not really down with. And I think that's where I kind of have no time for. The place that I do have a lot of time for, especially, is definitely within the fashion industry. I think for the longest time, I think women have let the fashion industry get away with murder in terms of how they're represented in fashion. I think this idea that all women are, you know, skinny and a particular size is just insane. I think for the most part, the biggest buyers of fashion 
especially in the high street, are women of an average or everyday kind of, not the average body size is probably, I don't know, size 12 and up or whatever it may be. So to kind of have women in size zero on the model shoot or whatever it may be, uh, uh, kind of advertising and marketing these brands is really, really reprehensible. And for as much as, for as much negative is um, kind of ascribed to kind of the ma- the male uh, kingdom and for all the negative they kind of give the patriarchy i think women have done a really really haven't helped situation either by kind of you know perpetuating this idea that women, all women want to have big tits be skinny and have a big ass like all women might want that but not all women can have that and there's a lot of women out there who are more than happy living in the skin that they are and kind of being happy the way they are and kind of all they want to see is being themselves represented in a vogue magazine represented in a billboard and now it's happening more so than often more so it's happening because of pop stars such as uh, Rihanna, such as reality TV stars, such as Kim Kardashian have come in and actually been appealing to the everyday woman, which is ironic considering some of these reality TV shows and pop star people, where the, where the people, these brands or these media companies would tell us have no connection with the real woman, but they actually do, more so than the actual brands, which is, you know, annoying to see. But anyway, this is an article from BBC. It's, uh, it's It says the following. It's written by a woman called, or a person called Charlie Jones, which is a woman. It says the following. Um, Megan Jane Crabb was a five years five years old when she started a war with her body. Instead of making friends with her first, instead of instead of making friends on her first day at school, uh, she was comparing herself to her peers and telling herself she was chubby. Now she has more than a million Instagram followers and recently told Parliament that fat phobia should be recognised as a form of prejudice. Now I don't like the fact that chubby is written in air quotes. I think if you're chubby, you're chubby. We know what... I don't think we need to kind of recontextualize words. We see what we see. Somebody's fat, somebody's skinny is what it is, but we shouldn't be judging people based on their weight. That's fair and fine, but let's not let's not get down the lane of the... Uh, let's not get let's not get to a place where we're, we're suddenly saying air quotes around chubby. Chubby is chubby, skinny is skinny, fit is fit. It is what it is, isn't it? Um, it took Megan almost two decades to accept her body. The years leading up to that were fraught with yo-yo dieting, crippling anxiety, a spell in a residential psychiatric hospital, and at 21, having dropped out of college and then university, she hit her target weight. Still, she hated everything about herself, which again has nothing to do with her her weight has more to do with her where you see herself i think as well when i think i have to say from my journey i mentioned previously that i essentially lost weight because i wanted to get with more girls and i wanted to fit into nicer clothes once i did that i realized that that wasn't actually a goal the goal was actually to be fit and healthy right especially since i started to get into the whole um self-actualization route self-development route reading the four-hour work week and going down that whole rabbit hole i started to realize that if i want to have mastery over my finances over my lifestyle over the friends i have around me if i want to cultivate a great peer group if i want to make sure i have the right kind of media coming in at me um audioly visually wherever it may be then I have to also be the master of my body, right? My temple. I have to have that under control too. That's just part of the process. Um, and then that was something that I actually enjoyed. Like I actually enjoy going to the gym. I enjoy kind of subjecting myself to miles and miles of running outside aimlessly. I like doing it. I don't do it specifically because I want to attract people or because I want to fit inside the clothes. That's a byproduct of it, but I like it because it brings me um, clarity. It kind of helps my kind of mental health. It allows me to kind of think about things. It allows me to kind of meditate on ideas. And it just allows me to have my own little alone time outside of everything else I'm doing on social media. I enjoy it. But to somehow say those um, those kind of activities or leading to depression, I don't think is right. I think maybe what happened internally was kind of aiding and abetting it but i don't know i'm, I'm a little bit skeptical of that idea that you know um you have to go through decades of dieting and running and your diet to then accept yourself usually it's a fact of like you didn't accept yourself in the beginning and now you set yourself that's why you're better i would say but anyway I continue i knew that no matter what way i got to she says here it would never be enough megan now is now 26 i can't continue that life i knew there had to be more my eating disorder had taken so much from me i wasted so much of my time and refused to let it take any more somehow I stumbled across an image of a woman on Instagram wearing a bikini and taking, talking about accepting her body, not dieting and living her life as she was. I never really believed that was an option before. Which again, I don't have a problem with. I think accepting for you for who you are is fine. I think there's some, there's a portion of the population that is very much okay with just, you know, clocking in, clocking out, answering to the man, living an everyday life, going on a couple of holidays a year, hanging out with their friends on a Friday night, um, looking after their kids, you know, cleaning the car on a Sunday, you know, picket, white picket fence, two kids and a dog. That's fine. But I don't think those people should be allowed or should be encouraged to judge the people who 
want more from life, who are always challenging themselves, who, you know, a billion isn't enough. They want two, they want three, they want four. Two billions isn't enough, they want five, they want six. You know, they keep constantly improving, they're trying to learn languages, they're traveling the world, they're working out all the time. We shouldn't judge each other. I think if you're okay just being a regular schmegular dude or girl, that's fine. And if you're okay, you know, consistently um, chasing a dragon, that's okay too. We shouldn't judge each other. I think that's where the issue that I have is like one person is then justifying themselves comparing to the, you know, high achiever person and the high achiever person is looking down on the person's regular schmegular and, you know, basically questioning their motivation, which I also don't think is fair because I don't think everyone is meant to be Jeff Bezos. Not everyone's meant to be Elon Musk. Some people are meant to be employees. They're meant to be the second, third, fourth, fifth, ten, tenth person in command. That's perfectly fine. Janitors at Tesla probably do are probably as important to the whole infrastructure of Tesla as the person designing the actual cars. Those are all okay. We all are we all kind of have a summer apart. So we all kind of help each other out, but all this constant pointing the fingers is idiotic. And again, like I said, let's not try and rewrite history, let's not try and rewrite science. We all can't pretend that being that way or being overweight in general is good for you in the long term. It isn't. We know it isn't. Sometimes maybe maintaining a certain weight is good for you, but being morbidly obese isn't. We can't say that's healthy. That's insane. It continues. Which and I don't. And I think she looks pretty cool to be honest. In my in my uh, in my opinion, and I think again, if I was a girl growing up now, it'd be quite cool to have her as an as an as a, a role model. Somebody somebody that looks like that especially if someone looks similar to the everyday girl because again like i said for the longest time fashion brands have been ignoring girls like this right they were purposely pushing one image and saying that was quote unquote normal or achievable for most people when it isn't most people don't want to do what they what models are doing to kind of look like that it's just what it is isn't it it continues here um long posts i've heard on social which i'm not going to read um the article says megan began posting body positive messages and photos on instagram about body f- body posse body posse panda and massing hundreds of thousands of followers she refers to herself as chubby in her post which is cool because she is and wants her followers to embrace this sort of language the word fat used to have a power to knock me out cold i spent my life in fear of being called fat i couldn't even see the world when i found out the body positive movement might as well open to a whole new way of seeing fat. It's just over another world, a way to describe your body, a new a new way to reclaim it. Now, the only thing that I have in terms of, I'd say anecdotally, which I'd say is probably a bit out of order, I've been in numerous trains and buses and I've seen how people react to fat girls, especially when they get on the bus. It's just, I have a lot of sympathy for it because I've been on the train and I've been sitting down and a bigger girl has got on and two people have got up when she sat down immediately because they didn't want to be squashed down. They've tried, they've essentially tried, gone out their way to make her feel uncomfortable. I think most guys I've seen on trains are a little bit more savvy and probably don't want to subject themselves to that level of embarrassment and they tend to never sit down and just stand up the whole time, um, which you can kind of understand. They don't want to put anyone out. They don't want to also you know embarrass themselves and, and you know be in a mood when they get back home but i've seen some girls just tired and just want to sit down and, and boys or girls have stood up and essentially kind of made a noise or did something and it's been like wow people are so people can be assholes in it and i've seen that myself so i i have sympathy for some of it what she's going through but i don't know man there's a part of me that's like should you be really promoting this as like normality should this be something that should be encouraged or should we be as as much as we be having as much as we should have women that look like this on media in terms of you know showing what real women look like we should still be encouraging people to, you know, if you can and if you're bothered, you should try and lose weight because it's going to help you in the long run. That's it. Not a message of like, do it or you'll die or all that sort of stuff because that kind of leads into the territory of, you know, those kind of crazy um, evangelical preachers that say all oh, fans to go to hell. That's insane. But you should be allowed to like, you know, talk about your message and where you're kind of standing things but you shouldn't be telling people they're going to burn in hell and pushing it down their face. That's not on at all. But I also think there should be a balance. But also, then she might kick back and say to me, I know this isn't healthy, but I want to be this way. You don't have a right to keep telling me that I should work out, which is perfectly fine. Um, but again, I think for the girls coming up, it's probably a good thing to have somebody that looks like her and somebody that looks like Kylie on your social media feed because it allows you to kind of put things into perspective, right? One side, you've got a multi-billionaire at 22 who probably has all the resources in the world to maintain that level of weight that she has. And on the other side, you've got an irregular everyday girl like yourself who is smiling the same way Kylie is, who seems to be enjoying her life the same way Kylie is, but is doing it in another way, another aesthetic, and another kind of body type. And it's up to you as a person, as a viewer, scrolling your social media feed to kind of understand where you fall in that kind of lane, you know, what side you fall on the, on the tracks. But yeah, I, I'm a fan of her, man. I'm a fan of her. I think she looks cool. Um, I think the whole movement is pretty fine. 
Um, let's continue a little bit more. The article and finish it here. Megan began dieting at 10 and told her parents she wanted to be uh, healthier, but they soon realized it was developing into something harmful. By the time she was 14, she was diagnosed with eating disorder, and by 20, she ate hate in her body had taken up as much as brain space. She left education and took in a permanent role as a carer of her sister Gemma, who was cerebral palsy. She now has described herself as an activist, ugh, model, and public speaker, and has recently compared, completed a UK tour where she sang, danced, and discussed diet culture to combine with 2,000 people. There's an audience for it, man. It's an audience for everything, it seems like that. Everyone's got something they're going through. Recently, she was interviewed for Fern Cotton on her podcast, Happy Place. The book was later revealed that chat with Megan had transformed the outlook, telling Elizabeth Days how to full pod- failed podcast that it was a seminal moment for her. I can't tell you how transformative that chat was for me, Fern Cotton said. I was just hanging off her every word, and it was been another shift of consciousness for me where I realized how unkind I was still being to myself. I went on a beach holiday afterwards for a week, and I usually would hate wearing a bikini and beat myself up about this and that. I just didn't care. It was so wonderful. <laughs> Um, Megan, who lives in Colchester, Essex, uh, was recently invited to Parliament to talk about the government qualifies office. We cannot have it. Uh, anyway, it's a good, it's a good article. I recommend checking. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. Um, she she does she puts on a good show. It looks like um, celebrating girls of every weight, and I'd imagine going to that kind of event would probably fill you loads of confidence. Um, you probably leave it with a glow up hanging over you, but you know the world is a harsh and dangerous place. The moment you go on the train, the moment you stand on the escalator, the moment you try to find the fitting room, the moment you try to find something to in your size in the shopping center, all of a sudden, all those you know um, ideas of yourself come flooding back. All those negative thoughts come flooding back, and it's just annoying, isn't it? That you can't constantly be in this bubble all day round, which is again, which is probably one of the struggles and the challenge of kind of um, navigating this world in general. You can't essentially live in the world that you want. You live, have to live in a world that actually exists and operate in that regard. But yeah, big up Gemma, man. She's a cool... Is it Gemma or Megan? Megan, sorry. She seems like a cool girl. I recommend you check out the article. It's called I Spent My Life in Fear of Being Called Fat. I'll link in the show so you guys can check out. It's 